Hello, and welcome to another Read Aloud with an Intervention Specialist. I'm Christina, your Intervention Specialist, and today we're going to read another historical fiction piece. Since it is close to the time for elections, I thought it was more than suitable to read about our past as Americans. This book is called The Ballot Box Battle by Emily Arnold McCuffley. McCuffley. It is about women's rights to vote and women in general suffrage. I do hope that you will enjoy it. All the summer of 1880, Cornelia's job was to go next door, feed Mrs. Stanton's horse, and clean out the stall. Every afternoon, Miss Stanton put aside her work on the history of women's suffrage and gave Cordelia a writing lesson when she talked about some skirmish in her long battle for the vote. Cornelia always minded her manners and pretended to pay attention, but it seemed to have nothing to do with her. Writing was what she cared about. So here is Miss Stanton. And here's Cornelia riding her horse, getting her lessons. By autumn, Cornelia could trot, canter, gallop, and jump over a low crossbar. When she bragged to her brother Howard that she could ride, he said, Oh, well, you're not a true horseman until you jump a four-foot fence. Looks like they're watching the dog. She repeated this to Miss Staunton. The great lady sighed. I'm afraid old Jewel is too worn out to jump that high, but someday you will have your own horse and you will do it. Cornelia was disappointed. She wanted more than anything to jump a four foot fence now. After their lesson on the first Tuesday in November, she asked Miss Stanton, did you jump when you were my age? Miss Stanton didn't answer at first. Do you know that today is election day, Cordelia? Cordelia shook her head no. A new president will be chosen, but no woman will vote, Miss Stanley went on. Well, why should they, Cornelia thought. All that was done by men. She repeated her question. Miss Stanton, did you jump a four-foot high fence when you were my age? Miss Stanton said, Indeed, I jumped a four-foot high fence and across a ditch. I did it to prove my courage. Why? Cordelia asked, very interested. So here we go, back in time. This is Miss Stanton when she was a little kid, okay? There were six children in my family. The only boy was my older brother, Elijah. He was the pride of my father's heart, a new honors graduate of Union College. Suddenly, dear Elijah fell ill. When he died, then he died. Cornelia gasped, "What if Howard were to die?" We were so sad, but my father's spirit was utterly broken. Every day and nearly all night, he sat in the darkened parlor beside Isidore's coffin. For me, it was as I was losing father too. I couldn't bear it. So I went into the parlor and climbed into his lap to comfort him. He didn't speak for a long time. Finally, he said, Oh, my daughter, I wish you were a boy. Oh, my, Cornelia whispered. She wondered if her father wished she was a boy like Howard. Were boys really better than girls? What did you do? I said, Papa, I will try to be all my brother was. But how? Cornelia asked. On the spot, I made a resolution to give less time to play and more to study. <laughs> I thought boys are learned and courageous, so I could study Greek and practice managing a horse. 
then I too would be learned and courageous and my father would be glad. I got up early the next morning and ran next door where I knew that my friend, Pastor Hosack, would be hoeing his garden. I said, do you like girls better or boys? He answered, well, girls, of course. Then I said, well, I am a girl and I must learn Greek. Will you please teach me? He found an old battered Greek grammar he had used himself and we set to work. I weeded alongside him and by breakfast time, I had mastered my first Greek lesson. I was so excited and hopeful. It was hard to go back home to the awful gloom at my own house. For Ezuel's funeral, the church bells tolled and tolled. Even now I shudder at that sound. I studied with Pastor Hosack by the day and went with Father every evening in the cemetery. When he threw himself upon Ezuel's grave, I leaned against a poplar tree, thinking, might I die as my brother had? Could learning and courage protect me? Pastor Hosack was my great solace. In horseback riding, of course, I rode and rode with the wind, daring myself to go faster and jump higher. Four feet high? Cornelia asked. In time, answered Miss Staunton. I drove Pastor Hohack's buggy when he called on parishioners, reciting Greek to him. When we visited our house, I whispered, Tell Father how quick I am, how much I've learned. And he would say, What a fine Greek scholar I was. I waited for the words I longed to hear. She's as good as any boy, but my father never said them. Then Pastor Hosack decided that he had taught me all he knew. A class of boys, all older than I, studied Greek as well as Latin and mathematics at the academy in town. I joined the class, the only girl. People believed that girls' brains were not capable of absorbing anything but simple reading, writing, and arithmetic. After elementary school, they were taught to sew and to paint pretty watercolors. The academy was very hard. I wanted to be taken seriously, as boys were. They stared at me and whispered about me and snickered. But I showed them. I soon ranked second in the class. Two prizes were awarded for excellence at the end of the year. I was determined to win one of them. I imagined what would happen. I would run home with my prize in Greek, which no girl had ever won, and I would find my father in his office, surrounded by his law books. I would show him my proof of learning. He would not be able to hide his surprise and pleasure, and he would say, well, a girl is as good as any boy after all. Oh yes, Cornelia explained, and you were courageous too, jumping on your horse. Finally, prize day came. One prize was awarded to a boy, and the other went to... You, Cornelia cried, yes to me. I raced home to my father's office, sure that as last he would say that I was as good as any boy. I handed him the prize, a Greek testament. He took it from me. He looked very pleased that I had won it. He asked me some questions about the class. I answered as patiently as I could, since all of my hopes were pinned on hearing those magic words. He kissed my forehead sighed and said, Oh, my daughter, you should have been a boy. Cornelia felt her body go limp. Oh, no, she said. It was a valuable lesson. It taught me to go on fighting, and I have, Mrs. Stoughton replied. And you will, too. You will fight because you are a girl. Now we're back in the present. A wagon had drawn up in front of Mrs. Staunton's house. A man got out and rapped at the door. We are here to collect voters, said the man. The men, on the, the men of the house are away, Miss Staunton replied. She glanced at Cornelia. But I have resided in Tenafly for 12 years, and I am three times the legal voting age, and I can read and write. I will come and vote. The men snickered and rolled their eyes. Cornelia was embarrassed for Miss Staunton, and she thought the men were just like Howard at his worst. Cornelia, said Miss Staunton, you follow along on Jewel. Cornelia almost said, I don't want to go to the poll, but she couldn't resist riding Jewel through town. 
So Miss Staunton, one of the men drawled, going to make a spectacle of yourself again? Sorry, this thing's really messed up. Here we go. They stopped at Watson's Row. Here's where I pay my taxes, Mrs. Staunton observed. What a surprise. Cornelia's father's paid the taxes in her family and complained about it. Men milled around outside. Howard was there, too, with some of his friends. Delia, he called. Go home where you belong. She ignored him. But father might be angry if, she, if he knew she was there. We have attempted to vote many times over the years, Miss Taunton said. And always our reception is the same. Come inside, Cordelia. Cordelia had no choice but to follow that command. After all, Jewel was Mrs. Stanton's horse. The pole was filled with men. Miss Stanton entered to a buzz of protest. One of her escorts stepped forward and said to the inspectors, Mrs. Stanton is here for the purpose of voting. He couldn't keep a straight face. The inspector's mouths fell open in sh mock amazement. One man put his arms around the ballot box and covered the slot with his hand. He said sarcastically, Oh no, madam, only men are allowed to vote. The men were all looking. Cornelia was thankful that she was small. She could have preferred to be inv invisible. Mrs. Stoughton broke in ringing tones. Congress has declared that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside and therefore are entitled to vote. I wish to cast my vote as a citizen of the United States. Two inspectors pulled their hats over their eyes. The one holding the ballot box growled. There's nothing to do with the Constitution. Women don't vote. Seeing that she could not pull her, put her ballot in the box, Miss Stoughton flung it at the hand covering the slot, saying, I have the same right to vote that any man here has. She threw her magnetic glance around the room and extended a hand to Cordelia. The day will come when this girl may vote, two men said. Hear, hear. Cornelia wanted to sink through the floor. She would never vote. How could she endure such shame? How could she ever be as brave as Miss Staunton? Outside, Howard and her, his friends chanted, No votes for pea-brained females. They put their faces up to hers, laughing and mocking. Something inside Cornelia snapped. She threw herself onto old Jewel and gave her a good kick. The boys barely managed to scramble out of the way. She galloped up the street. This was old horse. Was this was this old horse? La, la, la. Was this old horse really worn out? They had to try. Jewel, let's take that fence. She cried. Come on, we can do it, Jewel. Jewel went whinnied, broke into a canter, and sailed over the fence. Cornelia looked back. It was a good four feet high. Bully for you, shouted Miss Staunton. The old war horse has fight in her yet. The end. As you know, I always read the author's note in the back to explain what this book was about and to give you some more insight. The book is falling apart on me as we speak. <laughs> it's a little old. <laughs> But it doesn't mean that it's bad or it's not worth anything anymore. See, the more stuff's coming out. I'll just have to wait, I guess. Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, scholar, author, and mother of seven children, first called for the vote for women at the Women's Rights Convention she organized in Seneca Falls, New York, in 1848. At the time, the notion that women would vote was thought, even by most, of those attending the conference to be a ridiculous idea, but she per per persevered. Two years later, she met Susan B. Anthony, and the two fought in devoted partnership for the vote and for equal rights in education, marriage, employment, and government until Mrs. Staunton died in 1902 at the age of 87. Mrs. Staunton was the four 
most philosopher of the women's movement and its finest speaker, addressing legislators in state capitals and in Washington, running for Congress in 1866, and publishing a barge of resolutions, petitions, and articles that kept the issue before the public for 50 years. Remarkably, this brilliant tactician never lost her sense of humor. In 1880, she made the attempt to vote in Tenafly, New Jersey. That is recounted here. After Miss Daunton's death, Miss Anthony and many others continued to fight for women's rights. The 19th Amendment granting women to vote finally passed in 1920. Miss Daunton believed in equal opportunities for every kind of woman, educational, economic, professional, and spiritual. She saw that if women were f to free themselves, they would have to change their own thinking. They could not let men govern them simply because they were men. She had not wallowed in self-pity when her father devalued her sex and had instead taken immediate action, developing the qualities that society denied girls. She urged intentive and self-reliance of all women. Her courage, loyalty, wisdom, and zest for life were an abiding inspiration and remain so today. For the stories from Miss Stanton's life, I drew on biographies by Alame Lutz and Louise Banner and on Mrs. Stanton's own memoir, 80 Years and More. But Cornelia is a made-up character. She would have been 50 years old in 1920 when she would have cast her first vote, thinking of Mrs. Stanton and her horse. Should ask what year this was written or published. Nineteen ninety six. So there you have it. Thank you for joining me today with Read Aloud with the Intervention Specialist. I hope you enjoyed reading um, this Reese Told event. Um, and I hope that you have gained some um, perspective into how things were back in the day, over a um, hundred plus years ago. Um, and I hope that you will continue to um, move forward with progress and equality.